Grace, mercy, and peace to you, and God our Father, and our Lord, and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon this morning is based on the gospel reading out of Mark 6, uh, where Jesus walks on the water. Last week, Pastor Grimmer gave us a very comforting sermon about Jesus feeding 5,000 men, plus women and children, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee with five loaves of bread and two fish. It's comforting because one of the things that we learn from this miracle is that Jesus still miraculously feeds and, and graciously feeds and gives us good things today, especially through his word and sacrament. But in Mark's gospel, right after Jesus did that incredible feeding miracle, something really strange happens. And after the strange thing, something really troubling happens. Jesus gets up right after that meal, the feeding of the 5,000, and he had his disciples get in the boat and begin to cross to the other side of the sea to a city called Bethsaida. And Jesus took the opportunity to go up on the mountain to pray. And the story gets strange when in the middle of the night, a windstorm pops up on the, on the lake. And this is not uncommon. Storms popped up all the time on the lake. So the boat was not making much headway out in the middle of the sea. And the way Mark tells this, the disciples, they aren't scared. They're not worried. They're not crying out in fear or thinking they're drowning or anything. They're just struggling against the wind in the early hours of the morning. And then Jesus, this is the strange part, the first strange thing. Jesus, from his position up on the mountain praying, can look down in the middle of the night, three in the morning, out onto the dark sea several miles out. And he sees that the disciples are making headway painfully in this stiff wind. And so he gets up, he walks down the mountain, he walks out onto the sea several miles to where they are. Except he doesn't walk to the disciples, he walks by them. He intends to just pass <coughs> them by, Mark says. I can't imagine how dark it is out on the lake in the middle of the night. The stiff wind coming off the mountain would have whipped up some pretty big waves. The wind in their ears would have caused, and, and the, 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 the waves against the boat would have been hard to, to have conversation, perhaps. Mark doesn't say what Jesus intends to do out there walking by his disciples in the middle of the lake in the middle of the night. Does he intend to comfort them in the middle of the night in their battle against this wind? Does he intend to just walk right by them to the city on the other side, ahead of them? Does he intend to show that he has power over the wind and the waves and nature and, and, and storms? I don't know. Mark just doesn't say why he does this. But I know this. When the disciples saw Jesus, or a man, walking out on the water in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm, they start screaming in terror, terrified that they've seen a ghost. If Jesus' intent was to comfort them with his power over creation, it didn't work. It scared them. If Jesus hoped they would see him and be relieved that our Lord is with them, even in the middle of a difficult storm, then they disappointed him. They weren't relieved. If Jesus wanted to call out to them to, to ask him for help in the middle of their struggle, then they failed him. All they did was scream in terror. Immediately, though, upon hearing their frantic cries, Jesus says, take heart. It's me. Don't be afraid. And he steps up into the boat with them. And without saying anything else, the wind ceased. Now keep in mind that these are Jesus' disciples, the, the ones who have been with him from the beginning. If anyone were to understand Jesus, it would have to be these guys. I mean, they didn't just hear about Jesus like, like we have. They didn't just listen to stories about him like so many people. They were his inner group, his trusted companions, his closest friends. And that night... He scared the living daylights out of them. It's a strange thing that Jesus did. But for me, here is the most troubling part, the strangest part of the whole story. Mark says this, 
The disciples were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. If Jesus' disciples could see all that they saw and hear all that they heard and do all that they did and still not understand about the loaves, about the feeding of the 5,000, because their hearts were hardened, then what about us? If there is something about the feeding miracle that Jesus did the day before that should have given them understanding about the nature miracle he did this night, then how can we understand it? If the very men who Jesus picked by hand to be his most trusted companions in his earthly ministry were blinded by the hardness of their hearts, then where does that leave us? See, the problem, as, as I see it, is that the disciples were still totally misunderstanding the purpose and intention of Jesus' ministry. I think it's fair to say they placed expectations on him that had nothing to do with his work. Some say, uh, theologians today say they saw Jesus as some kind of a bread king. And his feeding of the 5,000 confirmed that. In other words, he's a guy who would be king and rule over them, but above all, he would keep their bellies full. I think here in North American Christianity, we can relate to that. We're so casual and relaxed that we often have the same sorts of ideas about God. God is, above all, our buddy. God is our friend. We like to think that God will bail us out of any problem we ever have at any time we need him. We expect God will not let us struggle, not let us suffer, not let us be unhappy even for a moment. For God, for us, God is whatever we want him to be whenever we need him. But the troubling lesson for the disciples is the same as it is for us. God is God. And we are not. When Jesus walked out on that storm and scared the daylights out of his disciples, maybe he was not trying to comfort them. Maybe he intended to just let them struggle against the wind. When he got into the boat and suddenly the wind ceased, Mark gives no indication that it had anything to do with the disciples whatsoever. We like to think that Jesus saw their struggle with the wind and their fear of seeing a ghost and he had compassion on them. But Mark gives no hint of that. Maybe Jesus just, just did it because he wanted to. Maybe it wasn't about the disciples at all. Maybe it was all about Jesus. When the disciples were utterly astounded, speechless, at a loss for words, because they didn't understand about the loaves, maybe what Mark is saying is they didn't really understand Jesus. They didn't understand that God is God and, and they are not. God does what God wants to do and his actions don't have to be understood by us. Or take us. When Jesus works among us, we would also do well to remember that God is God and that we are not. He does things the way that he wants to do them even if they don't make sense to us. After all, he is God. When we see the devastating consequences of our sin and our lives and we wonder why it is that God allows such things to continue, we would do well to remember that God is God and we are not. When we hear that our sins are forgiven through the, through the words of a sinful pastor, we would rather God work through much more showy and powerful ways. We would do well to remember that God is God and we are not. When God tells us that it is through his word that we are called to faith and that faith is entirely God's work and that we have nothing to do with it, we would do well to remember that God is God and we are not. When he feeds us with his body and blood, the Lord's Supper, and he says that his bread, this bread and the wine actually is his body and blood given for us for the forgiveness of our sins and the strengthening of our faith, it doesn't have to make sense to us. For he is God. And we are not. And when he says that the only way to set us free from our bondage to sin and death and the power of the devil is to send his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that doesn't have to make sense to us either. If God is God, he's going to do things that are beyond our understanding. He is God and we are not.
And what a God we have. Despite our sin, despite our unworthiness, our insistence that we are God, that we must understand God, he is still merciful and gracious to us. In spite of our broken, pathetic attempts to be our own God, he still comes to us again and again to actually be our God, to give us the forgiveness of sins, to strengthen our faith. He is still with us. He still causes us to be his people. He still loves us and is merciful to us. God is God, and we are not. And there is so much comfort there for us when the world seems to be crumbling around us, when he's struggling to understand a a devastating medical diagnosis, uh, when your marriage is falling apart, when it looks like you might lose your job. Know that God is God, and his ways are not our ways. He sees things we don't see. He does things we don't understand. He allows things we can't comprehend. In his own strange way on the cross, God has already set you free from sin and death and the power of the devil. And he has promised to return on the last day to finally, fully, and at last set all things right again. And he is with you. He has promised to be with you every day in between. Thanks be to God. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.